I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, all about aviation here at the Dubai Air Show. Coming up, the big players talk to us Emirates Airlines, Qatar Airways, Boeing, about how they're maintaining altitude in these economically difficult times. And the military spend considerably less fanfare but considerably more money. We hear about the Eurofighter, which made its debut in the skies over Libya. So welcome back to Dubai, everyone. The second time in two years we've brought you Counting the Costs from the Dubai Air Show, which in itself tells you about what an important event it has become. Each week on this program, we're always talking about the problems in North America and Europe, the economic slowdowns. Certainly in the aviation sector, it puts the emphasis, even the pressure, you might say, on this part of the world to deliver the goods for the sector. Coming up, we're going to be talking to some of the major players, the likes of Boeing, who've brought their 787 Dreamliner with them for its Middle East debut, three and a half years late, admittedly, but it is finally here. Also, we're going to look at how you would judge the success of an air show and here's just some numbers to give you an idea of how the last few shows have gone 2007 four years ago 155 billion dollars worth of planes were ordered it was a massive bumper year and then 2009 it fell right off right down to only 14 billion dollars as we really hit that credit crunch that global economic crisis already here at the 2011 show on day one we saw a huge order by emirates up to 26 billion dollars so the money spent at the last show has already been exceeded in just one order but there are still a lot of issues in this aviation sector which we will be looking at later on in the program you wouldn't call it an industry in free fall but these are not easy times for the aviation business oil's consistently above hundred dollars a barrel demand from europe is declining and somehow airlines have to find the cash to keep flying everyone's looking for a kickstart. Uh, there's obviously a lot of problems um, for the European airlines and for the legacy carriers. We know if you look at the figures from some of the big American airlines, they're struggling. They just can't make money anymore. They've got old practices. So time for some fresh blood. This is a good start. Boeing 787 Dreamliner finally on the ground in the Middle East. We were allowed on board for a quick look around. So this test plane's been configured 333 three, three seats across. It's a little tight. I wouldn't say there's any huge amount more uh, leg room. Certainly some other creature comforts. The lighting's interesting. While we've been in here, it's kind of purple and orange at the moment, but it does keep changing. The idea is that it would uh, wake you up a bit more gently rather than that harsh wake up that you sometimes get on an overnight flight. So that's a bit more comfortable. Overhead bins are actually quite interesting. A lot bigger. Uh, as we wind it down, four roller cases can be fit in here. So the theory is that everyone on this plane would be able to bring one of those roller cases and put them in there and, and not have to fight for space. So all up it's actually, oh there goes the lighting changing now, all up it's pretty impressive actually, only flying commercially with one airline at the moment, that's all Nippon Airways. So we've all got a little bit longer to wait to find out just how dreamy it really is. But it was her predecessor, the 777, which featured in the first big play of the show, Dubai-based Emirates ordering 50 of them, with an option for 20 more. The whole deal worth $26 billion. But plane orders only tell you so much about the industry. And there are plenty more concerns without considering the downturn in Europe. Top of the list is the price of oil, which represents 40% of the industry's costs. And you know, I don't know if you have noticed, oil price have never been so high for so long. Because in the past, oil price will go up for one month and then it will drop down. Uh, when we say high oil price, anything above 100 is, is high for, for the airline business. And then there's personnel issues. So the industry has some real problems in attracting new people to come into this industry. And they're not spending on it now. It's 10 years time that these new people coming in will be any good. So there's a crisis, actually. Two years ago, only $14 billion worth of plane orders were made at Dubai, with just the Emirates order that has already been passed. But that'll only kick in in a few years' time, when everyone's hoping the world's economic woes will be over. Let's return for a moment to the headline story, Emirates' purchase of those 50 Boeing 777s, an option on a further 20. What it does is underline the word expansion. 
the game that Emirates has played since its inception has really set the pace for as well. We had a chance to talk to the president of Emirates Airlines, Tim Clark. Well, I, I, I don't think this order is uh, a change to the way we've done things in the past. Last year in Berlin, we ordered 32 uh, 380s, and a month later, we ordered 30 777s. So last year, there were 62 aircraft ordered. This year, it's 50. Why? These aircraft come in in the first quarter of 15, so we're three and a half years away from their arrival. By that time, we're confident there will be equi equilibrium back in the global economy. And this is what we tend to do. We will, you know, we will order aircraft with a view to the long term uh, and place those orders so that they come between, uh, in this case, uh, the first quarter of 15 and they are being delivered over a period of four or five years. So it's not as if they're all coming at one point. And a lot of people tend to think that when Emirates orders, the next day all these aircraft are going to arrive and where are we going to fly them all and what are we going to do with them? We have a large retirement program going on. 70 aircraft are going out of the original uh, fleet that we had many years ago. And part of this order is to see their replacement as they go out. Right. Excellent. So that gives us the long-term idea. And that is, it's interesting to know about the, the retirement plan because it puts it in some perspective. Mm -hmm. Short term, uh, when we talk about the current operating environment, bad profit numbers recently, and you talked about the price of oil, which is something you can't do anything about. Mm. Well, let me correct you. Bad profit is, is not the way I would look at it. I fact, the fact that we got a profit at all in this business is amazing. Um, we grew our business, we grew our income substantially, our yields were remained high, everything was going in the right direction. The capacity uh, was outstripped by the demand for that capacity, so we actually had an increase in seat factor over that time. What hit us was the fuel. Mm. And in the first six months of this year, we were nearly 50% higher on our fuel into plane costs than we were in the corresponding six months last year, which meant that we took $1 billion straight off the bottom line in the first six months of our financial year. Had that not been the case, mm. the profits would have been the record for the first six months of any of our operating years since we started. So presumably this is now something you really have to factor of in. Of course. I, I talked to the, the CEO of Fly Dubai yesterday who yeah. pointed out that the, the, the price of oil has not been at this high level for such a sustained period Correct. for a very long time. So you've, you say you've got to build that in for the next... He, he's absolutely right. And, and it, it is a little bit dogged in the sense that it's stayed up there. It's been as, as a sustained level. It would ordinarily have not been like that. And why do I say that? Because at the moment we have dis disequilibrium in the global economy. And we know why. So as the, there is a withdrawal from the equity markets, the bond market, mm. sovereign debt, etc., where have they got to go where they can ensure some kind of return? Food, prices are rising. Oil stays high. These are in the hands of a few to make quite a lot of money out of that. And as a result, when you have demand destruction to the extent that we have seen in the last nine months to, to a year, in the global economy and yet nor uh, fuel prices go north when simple applied economics tells you that a fuel price should fall mm -hmm. then something is going on that is perhaps other forces are at play and this is what we see with oil so we have to navigate our way through that if that means that we have to deal with oil prices at level if there's a paradigm shift in the way that oil is um, purchased, the way we go about purchasing, and we have to face realities that are going to stay in and around $100, things will have to change. But the problem with the airline industry, it stripped itself of costs so many times, the cupboard is now bare. There's not a lot There's of There's no nowhere to strip down anymore. There, sure. It's very difficult, short of shrinking your operation and, mm. and laying off routes and aircraft and people, etc., etc. We've never done that in Emirates. We've mm. always managed these global traumas um, and we, we have fluctuations in our profit margins, we have fluctuations in income, but we still manage to keep our heads above water, keep ourselves cash positive, grow the balance sheet, so we still have a very strong balance sheet. And the reason we do this kind of thing, mm -hmm. Order 50, is because historically we have managed the effect, whether it be the Iran-Iraq war in the early years of our existence, in mm -hmm. 1988, 85, it was going on before that, then you see the, the first uh, invasion of Kuwait, 
and, one, and yeah. the first war, the second war, and so on. I can go on about the geopolitical mm. seismic effects we've had in this region. And all that time, Emirates has grown its business profitably um, in a very meaningful manner. You mentioned a lot of regional issues as far as tensions go and, and the way it's been over history. The other regional issue you've got is competition and this is something I always ask players in this region because it still amazes me that you can have Abu Dhabi, Dubai and Doha within an hour of each other and have three huge expanding airlines all competing for the same, the same customers. I've got Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, in, Singapore Airlines in Singapore I've got KLM Air France, Lufthansa British Airways, within 300 miles of each other. In okay. other words, it's nothing new? No. Nope. Why should it be? And look at the scale of what they're doing. And but look at the, size. the scale of your expansion here, not just Emirates, but Qatar and Etihad, mm. is very, very big. It's and a, it's, it it's, yes, it, is, it has taken the aviation world by storm, given the, the time that we have de delivered these, these, these airlines. Um, as compared to the legacy carriers perhaps in Europe, America or whatever. <laughs> but I keep saying, guys, this is all about the world changing post mid 90s. You didn't have Africa exploding. You didn't have a China, mm. the Sex scale. You didn't have an India or a South America. Under Lula da Silva, the Brazilian economy exploded and is still continuing to mm. grow. If you do not harness that or adapt your business models because hitherto they've been legacy driven post-war European traffic patterns the Europeans take the Africans to Asia and mm. all this kind of, that's all changed now mm. and adaptation is key to what is going on in the economy in every business model whether it's an aviation one telecommunications maritime whatever the world has changed it's there and we are great opportunists we are great optimists can we all do the same thing. Of course we can, because if you've got, you know, we they announced seven billion people on the planet the other day. I don't know who was doing the counting, but anyway, <laughs> seven billion people. So the world is growing. And you know something? Everybody is exposed now. When you talk about the African, people tended to think of Africa of AIDS, genocide, mm -hmm. poverty, I don't know, tribalism, etc. And Excuse now it's me. growth. It's you have huge growth in these mm -hmm. economies. The Chinese could see that and they're in there big time. Okay. Ahead of the Americans else. are in the West because there's a lot of oil there, and the Europeans are saying, what's going on? Mm. You know, frankly, it's huge, and it's not going to stop because the man or woman in the street now has had a taste. Yes, there will be a degree of pushing the cork down, but that cork is going to keep bouncing back. And it's, 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 it's fascinating to see what happens. So we see here, almost as a voyeur of the global economy, we facilitate, but we don't actually create. Mm. We just say, we could see what is going on in China, we can see what is going on in India, we can see what is going on in South America, and we can link them all up because they want to travel, mm. and they do. And that's never going to stop. It might slow a little bit, but it'll carry on. That's why we ordered the 50. Tim Clark there from Emirates, and the man he bought those planes from is the man who brought this plane, the 787 Dreamliner. We spoke to the president of Boeing, James Albon. It was a big deal. We've never had a bigger sale than that by, by dollars. Uh, took a while to come together, but I think it's just a testimony to what's going on here in the Middle East, the tremendous growth that they're seeing, and the fact that from, from this location, you can fly to, to every large city in the world. Mm and uh, they are buying wide-body airplanes uh, here at, at numbers nobody ever would have dreamed of years ago. So you become the beneficiary of the expansion plans of the likes of Emirates or, or Qatar Airways because, I mean, uh, we were talking before that they're now going from yeah. the Middle East all over to the, to the yeah. west coast of well, the United States. Well, we, we have benefited from that, but certainly uh, we got to provide the right product. And, and these are very smart buyers here, very discerning buyers, and. You know, our product, I think, because we focus so much on performance and capability, it's allowed us to win a lot of contracts here. Does one plane um, cannibalize the other? The 787, the new one, the Dreamliner, which is here, and the 777, are they going to almost end up competing with each other? No, what we try to do is, is position our airplane so there's a, about a 15 to 20 percent capacity difference. And we try to target the airplanes for different markets. You look at the, the 787, it's a long haul uh, 
medium-sized airplane. Mm. You look at the triple seven, it's a long haul, you know, big airplane. So we try to make sure that we don't butt up against each other. So as even we with got only to 15 to 20 percent difference, that's considered that, enough that's, to, that's to, enough. to not. To, you know, there are thin routes, there are medium routes, and there are thick routes, and we try to target our airplanes for those routes. Okay. Uh, let's look at the wider picture now, the aviation picture, aside from the fact that you, you did a great deal with, with Emirates at the show. Your view on the sector as a whole, uh, maybe compared with two years ago when we were here. But well, two years ago, of course, uh, you know, we were in the doldrums. We didn't have a lot of orders, nor did Airbus two years ago. But it's amazing the way things have come roaring back. I, I think the big question in everybody's mind is, with what's going on in Europe and the slowdown in the economy in, uh, in the Americas, you know, what impact will that have on the rest of the world? Now, Quite frankly, we have not seen an impact on the rest of the world, but we're watching it very, very closely. So uh, if we get away from the, the Middle East carriers, are you still doing good business with US carriers, European carriers? Are they still buying? Well, we, we had a contract that we did with Air France, the KLM, earlier this year. Uh, there are going to be some announcements that you're going to see from some of the Asia Pacific carriers later this year. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, what you're seeing is a lot of the, the airlines you know, changing out a lot of the older equipment that's not as fuel efficient as the newer equipment. We just did a deal, as you know, down in, at, at American in Dallas. Uh, we just did a deal with, uh, with Delta down in Atlanta. And they're trying to flip their fleets because they see the price of oil mm -hmm. uh, driving their profitability down. So they need to have the most efficient equipment out there. And finding the money just to do business in general. Uh, you'll be aware Emirates were talking recently saying, with the banking sector being weak the way it is in Europe, yeah. they're looking to things like Islamic finance and, yeah. and, and other options, government options. Again, from a manufacturer side of it, do you have to explore other options? These well, days? you know, that is a big deal, financing, and, and I know that Airbus has been talking about, uh, you know, getting, getting capital in Europe is more difficult. In the United States, we still have uh, several leasing companies that, that are doing a lot of deals. Uh, you know, Bank of China, you know, very robust. Mm. But at the same time, you know, we want our finance organization to be more strategic. And we have worked with them on a number of deals, uh, American being one of them. We were a, a leaser of last resort. They're now being more strategic and helping us do the deals. James Alpo, they're the CEO of Boeing, a company which has really come in for a lot of criticism in the past, certainly from our next guest, the CEO of Qatar Airways, Akbar al -Baka. Two years ago here at the air show, I spoke to him, made his views very clear about his disappointment over the delays of the 787 Dreamliner. Here he is again two years later with his always forthright views. Pleased to see the, it, the it 787. Alter, it alternates between uh, air shows. One time I'm upset with Boeing, one time I'm upset with Airbus. So it keeps, you know, the fire on. So you're on upset board. with Airbus this time then? No, I'm no. not. <laughs> um, but happy to see the 787 here finally. When are you expected to get that in the air? Uh, our first uh, 787 uh, will be delivered to us uh, in the month of June next year, and we will receive five of them next year, and uh, another eight the following year, and then uh, another eight uh, the year after that. Is it that and important a plane, the way it's been built up? Everyone's been so excited about the Dreamliner for so long. I wonder if it's just because it got delayed so long that it built yes, up. Yes, I am as a CEO very excited about it because it has less maintenance cost it has less fuel burn, and it has the range that I need for that size, that mid-size aeroplane mm. to serve my uh, thin long-range routes. I want to talk about expansion with Qatar Airways because the thing I've noticed is the amount of new routes that have come on stream. Yeah. Uh, and not the places you might expect, the, the Benghazis and Ugandas of the world and Sofia and Tbilisi to come I think as well. Yes, different, and different we will, uh, exactly, and we will be also announcing some more very exotic destinations which nobody thought we will be going to. What's the theory behind it? Uh, to look at new opportunities to, uh, to uh, serve emerging markets, uh, to expand and make Doha a major hub in the Middle East. Let's talk about Doha, seeing as you mentioned it. Again, about a year ago, I think I spoke to you at the opening of the arrivals terminal um, because Doha International was basically bursting at the seams. Still is. Yes, and, and soon we will be soon. soon we will be opening uh, an expansion to our departure terminal. So you're having to expand. expand. We have to expand. Every time the airport is delayed, we have to expand the current facilities to cater for the expansion and. Uh, the fleet intake, which for you, intake of, which for uh, you is the, is the biggest carrier, can't be considered good enough. I mean, for, for this huge new terminal, uh, huge new airport. Any not passenger to amenity that I cannot provide 
to my passenger is a bad news to me as an airline. We are a five-star rated airline. Uh, today we are the best airline in the world and we want to continue this experience that our passenger get both in the sky and on the ground and we will not be able to deliver the highest class of services to our passengers on the ground until we move to a new Doha International Airport. Okay, let's look at the industry more widely. Um, I don't think sales of planes really tells us so much anymore because, as you say, it's looking well ahead or it's about replacing older planes. Uh, the issues for the industry at the moment seem to be all things which are perhaps out of your control. The price of oil, for example. Uh, the price of oil, yes, is out of control, but at the same time there is also a little bit that is uh, in our control of how we train our pilots and how they fly routes very fuel efficiently. There are so many things that you can do uh, to, uh, in a small way, uh, mitigate the risk of rising fuel cost, one. Secondly, is uh, to make sure that the aeroplanes are lighter. And thirdly, to buy fuel efficient aeroplanes. And this is why we are so interested in the, uh, uh, the 787, the Airbus A350 family of aeroplanes, which we are the largest cust single customer and that we are so interested in the Airbus A320neo. If I was to give you a scale of 1 to 10, of 1 being very poor, 10 being good, where would you place the aviation industry now with the pressures of the price of oil and with the I pressures will always, of what's happening uh, in Europe? I will always keep uh, aviation as number 10 because it is the worst business you can get into. Because? Because of uh, uh, the, the whole business being so economically sensitive. Mm. You know, it is... Uh, constantly up and down. It is so cyclical that, uh, you know, if a country cough, mm. we, we catch flu. Well, let's talk about Europe's cough then. It's had a cough for two years and it's not getting any better. That's got uh, to be impacting uh, and, you with and, the amount and, of routes and, you fly. There. And that is why it is even more important for me to uh, get uh, aeroplanes like the Airbus A350 and the Boeing 787s to uh, get our costs lower so we will be able to continue serving markets which are getting thinner. Would you, have you had to, the way we talked about, you've made adjustments because of the, the price of oil, have you made adjustments because of what's, of the downturn in Europe, have you had to make yes, tangible uh, things? Yes, by shifting capacity from place where there is a downturn, so we reduce capacity, but you don't reduce frequencies, you reduce capacity. And then you add that capacity to somewhere else where there is still economic activity or to go to new exotic places as you just mentioned. We're going to look at the military side of things here at the air show now, which is, it's kind of a conundrum because it's so in your face. You know, you can get up close and personal with a helicopter gunship like this and the jets have been flying maneuvers overhead. But then when it comes to the business deals, there is considerably less fanfare, certainly when compared with, say, Boeing or Airbus making a big sale. That said, it is worth thinking about the huge amount of money uh, which is involved in military spending all over the world. The numbers we've got here, this is not just aviation, this is total military spend. The headline, $1.6 trillion. That is how much governments spend all over the world every year on military. Of that, number one is the United States and a figure heading up towards $700 billion. And then it's a lot further down to the second spender, uh, which is China. Another piece of hardware that people have been really keen to talk about and get a look at is the Eurofighter, one of the newest types of fighter jets. It actually made its debut in the skies over Libya earlier in the year during the NATO operation. We spoke to Eurofighter's CEO, Enzo Casalini. Well, what we know is what uh, our customer told us, so the Italian Air Force and the Royal Air Force. And uh, we know that the efficiency of the aircraft was fantastic and the mission was accomplished in a perfect way. And by the way, the Royal Air Force made also some press conferences saying this, so we are confident the aircraft was performing uh, very well. Also, we understood that um, for this kind of reason, probably we are in the, in the right uh, direction with the enhancement of the aircraft, so new weapon to integrate and so on. Uh, explain to me, if you would, for a, 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 a viewer who's watching now, who's maybe not business-minded or military-minded, is looking at you and seeing you're, you're in the business of making warplanes, and as we've seen all this year, the battle's going on. I'm not going to say how do you reconcile what you do, but this is your business, and you have to treat it as such and, and leave the politics and leave all the discussions aside. I think. Yeah, you, you are right in a certain way, but you have also always to consider that the selling a weapon system like this, which is a high technology weapon system, is for the country that buy 
is always uh, an investment because in investing uh, it gives growth to the economy of the country and not uh, uh, of course you have uh, when you say you, you have to reduce the expenditure but you have to reduce expenditure where there are uh, 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 how can I say not efficiency not not uh, not right uh, expenditure but when you make investment this is the right thing to do because you have to change uh, the tendency of the economy and that is it for our special edition of counting the cost this week from here in Dubai if you want to get in touch with us our Twitter and web details are at the bottom of your screen right now we're going to leave you though this week with some of the fantastic pictures shot for us by our cameraman Ben Foley of the amazing acrobatic displays we saw here at the Dubai Air Show 2011